I'm hoping I'm recording. Alright, I think I'm recording. I'm going to assume I am. Anyway, what we're going to talk about today is um, what uh, a lot of MEMS devices are made out of polycrystalline materials as well as uh, crystalline silicon and occasionally they use amorphous silicon as well. Okay, so silicon, um, what we're going to talk about today is a, just we're going to cover amorphous materials, polycrystalline and crystalline materials. Then we'll talk about some unit cells, lattices, Miller indices, and then we'll talk a little bit about crystal growth. So when I say amorphous, what comes to mind? No shape? Okay, what else? No structure? Can you give me an example of something that's amorphous? Pardon me? Speak up. Water? A liquid, I don't know if that's amorphous. I think I think it has to be a solid. Silly putty. Ooh, that's a good one. Okay, what about something that's crystalline? What's a common example of something that's crystalline? Diamond, there you go. Diamond, right? I was that's why I was squinting. Um, diamond, that's a crystal. Quartz, right? Is a crystal. And then what's that weird one in the middle? Polycrystalline. What comes to mind? Silicon, yeah. Well silicon can be amorphous, polycrystalline, or crystalline. Plastic? I don't think so. You'll you'll see why in a little bit. Many crystals. So metals sometimes are that way. Right? Okay. Let's go to the next one. So amorphous, the definition of something that's amorphous is something that has no long range order. Okay, so that's the key thing. No long range order. If you look at the tiles on the floor, okay you can kind of predict where the tenth tile will be and the hundredth tile. If the tile layers are perfect, okay, you'll be able to predict where the millionth tile is. Okay, with an amorphous uh, material, you wouldn't be able to predict that. There's no long-range order on that atomic scale. Okay, so you can't predict um, where the next atoms will be, even over a relatively short distance. Okay, the other thing is cleaving. What's cleaving mean, first off? Yeah, it's like with, with a diamond, right? You hit it with um, a tool. I forgot the name of the tool, probably cleave. Cleaver. Yeah, cleaver. There you go. And, and you can get the diamond to break certain ways, depending how you hit it, right? Stripe? S-T-R-I-P-E? Oh, scribe. Scribe. Yeah, you can scribe crystals and then they'll break along that line. That's true. So you can't really cleave an amorphous solid. Okay, another type of amorphous solid would be glass. Certain types of glass. You break it, it shatters into little tiny pieces. You can't predict which way the, the um, break's going to go. Okay, and then the last uh, bullet there talks about band tailing. That has to do with the electrical properties of the material. Um, when you study about semiconductors, okay, you can have 
uh, materials that um, conduct, don't conduct, and sometimes conduct. The ones that don't conduct are called insulators. The ones that conduct are, can be metals. They're called conductors. Um, and then the ones in between are called semiconductors. So the, the band tailing tells you a little bit about the quality of the gap between being a conductor and being an insulator. Okay, so I'm not going to go into detail on that. Um, if you want to read up on it, though, it's it's quite interesting. If you're going to go into into material and electrical properties of materials, okay, polycrystalline is a little bit different than amorphous. There is long-range order, okay, and as um, we said earlier. Um, there are many crystals stuck together okay so one crystal can be relatively large even if it's a millimeter on a side you can have billions of atoms in that one little crystal okay so if you're inside the um, crystal structure and you look around it's got long-range order you know for thousands and thousands even millions of atoms it's it looks like one big crystal Occasionally you get to the edge of the little crystal called the grain boundary and then the orientation shifts all of a sudden. Okay, So there is predictability. You do have long range order but over the macro sense, over many millimeters or centimeters, you can have thousands of little crystals stuck together. Okay, So that's why it's polycrystalline. Poly means many and crystalline means crystal okay many crystals so one way to look at it is that it's many small crystals that are kind of stuck together okay when you talk about a band gap it's more distinct you don't have as much band tailing so the electrical properties start to look more and more like pure crystalline and then when you talk about a pure crystal it has very long range order, or extremely long range order. That should say range and not term. Okay. And has few defects. You can move from one end of the solid to the other and not see a difference in the placement of the atoms. So if you're inside the crystal, okay, it doesn't matter which atom you're at. The environment's always the same. It might matter which way you're looking to the way it looks to you. And we'll talk about that when we talk about Miller indices. But when you're inside the crystal, um, you can't really tell where you are. You can tell which direction you're looking, but you can't tell exactly where you are because everything is exactly the same. Okay? And it has a really well defined band gap. So there's a real sharp transition from what's called the um, uh, valence band or to the conduction band. Real sharp band gap. Okay, so based on what we said, which graphic is most like a crystal? The one to the right. Everybody agree? Okay, what about polycrystalline? Okay, and amorphous is the one on the left. If we look at it three-dimensionally, it's a little harder to see, right? Oops. Okay, crystal to the left, amorphous in the middle, and the right. So we got crystal on the left, amorphous in the middle and polycrystalline on the right. Now the picture on the right is a bit of an exaggeration. Okay, you do s you see a lot of a lot of crystals there in a very small range. Um, they're trying to show a lot there. They're showing the grain boundaries where there's a dislocation in the crystal structure. It's not the same. The orientation shifts all of a sudden and you can also see a missing um, uh, atom in there too. So they're showing a defect as well. Okay, so there are the answers. 
Now, when we talk about silicon, it has a diamond lattice. What other things have a diamond lattice when it's a crystal? What's diamond made out of? Carbon. So, you know, if you, someone gives you an ounce of carbon, it can either be worth a, a lot of money if it's in the structure of a diamond, or it can be worth nothing if it's soot. They're both carbon. They both are, you know, an ounce of carbon. But it's just the, the way it's oriented make, gives it value. Okay, so other materials um, include, of course, there's carbon, there's silicon. There's also germanium. Okay, so germanium is used with some semiconductor processes as well. Now there's a, um, a website on the bottom, and I'm going to switch to that website. Hopefully this will work. Okay, and when you get to the website, it comes up with a structure on the left. It, it defaults to um, gallium arsenide, and you can pick other structures or other materials. So if I pick silicon, okay, you can see it has the same basic structure, and all the but all the atoms are colored the same. So you can look at it from different points of view. Okay, so there's a lot of good information on this website. You can get the atoms per cubic centimeter. Look at that. There's 5 times 10 to the 22nd atoms. That's a lot of atoms. A billion is 10 to the 9th, right? A trillion is 10 to the 12th. I don't know what you call it after a trillion. <laughs> Quadrillion? Who knows? It's a lot. Okay, the atomic weight, you remember what that means? The atomic weight is 28. It's 28 uh, what? No, atomic weight, weight, weight. Nah, not really. It's 28 grams in one mole. Mole is Avogadro's number. You remember what that is? 6.023 times 10 to the 23rd. Okay, so if you get 6.023 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of silicon, they'll weigh 28 grams. So if someone says I've got a gram of silicon, you can tell me how many um, how many atoms there are in one gram of silicon. And different materials have different atomic weights. Okay. So a cubic centimeter is ten to the uh, twenty second. Five times ten to the twenty second atoms. So that would weigh what? Um, probably about one-tenth of the atomic mass. So it would be like two and a half grams or so. Okay. And there's a bunch of other information there. Um, the crystal structure is diamond. Okay. It's also, I think, called tetragonal, face center cubic. There's different ways you can call it. The density is 2.3 grams per cubic centimeter. There's the answer to that question I just posed. So a cubic centimeter has um, 2.3 grams of material in it. Uh, a bunch of other information there. Um, the energy gap, which is the band gap I was talking about. It's about um, one electron volt at 300 degrees Kelvin, which is, what, room temperature, roughly? Okay, so there's a lot of information. There's the melting point. 14, 15 Celsius. Okay. Good information here, but what, what I want to point to is the way the crystal looks. If I look at it end on, you can see that structure. 
But if I look at it from another perspective, it'll look like that. If I look at it diagonally, it'll look like that. So different orientations facing you will look differently. Okay? So if I try to cleave it from this side, it'll break differently than if I try to cleave it from a different side. Okay, if I hit it, hit it on this side, it'll break differently. And that's what we're going to do later. We're going to break some wafers. Okay? So we'll be able to tell what orientation the crystal's at. And that'll make more sense as we go along. Okay, let me get back to the thing. Okay. So, one thing that you have to try to figure out if you're a crystallographer or someone working with crystals is a road map, is a sense of direction, is a compass. And they call it Miller indices. Okay? I guess there was a guy called Miller who worked all this out originally. But we, we can look at a Cartesian coordinate. That's what this is, x, y, z. It's called a Cartesian coordinate. Okay, and we can describe directions as in relationship to the, to the Cartesian coordinate. So, if you're working with Miller indices, directions are given by um, numbers in brackets, three, three sets of numbers in brackets, x, y, and z. They represent x, y, and z. If you look at the one along the x-axis, okay, you've made one step in X, zero steps in Y, and zero in C, Z. So you signify it with one, zero, zero, and you use a square bracket. You can also use a pointy bracket. Okay, it has sharp edges. That's one way to remember. So the Z axis would be zero, zero, one. And the Y axis would be zero, one, zero. It always goes X, Y, Z. So you can get your orientation. So if I say take five steps in the zero, one, zero direction, you would take five steps along the y-axis, right? Does that make sense? Okay, it's just a, a shorthand. Okay, now planes get a little bit f flakier. Okay, they're represented by round brackets if you're going to write them down or these kind of brackets, um, classical brackets, I don't know what you call them. Okay, but the planes are defined by what's perpendicular to the vectors. It's a little bit more complicated to understand. So if you have a vector going along the one zero zero direction, the plane that's perpendicular to that, okay, moves up and down and would be parallel to the plane defined by the y and z axis. So the y and z axis plane, right? This vector is in Z, this other vector is in Y. That plane those two vectors define can be written as the one zero zero plane with round brackets. So it's the plane perpendicular to the vector. That's the key thing. And we'll do some hands-on with that in a little bit. So if you could look at the screen, this vector here Okay, I'm going to try to draw it out. Can you guys all see that? This vector here is what? Okay, somebody said 0, 1, 1. Does everybody agree? What's the definition? It's the plane that's perpendicular to the vector. It's coming up and down like this. This is a cube. So what's it perpendicular to? This one, this one, or this one? The one zero zero, the zero one one, or the one one one? 
Okay, one zero zero. Everybody agree? It's the one zero zero. Well, the if you take a look, the vector one zero zero goes along the x-axis. Now it's only the direction that matters. It's parallel to the x-axis. You can draw it anywhere as long as it's got the same direction. Because when you're in a crystal, everything looks the same. Okay? Except for the directions. So the one zero zero vector isn't just one specific vector. It can be any vector in that direction. Same thing with the plane. The one zero zero plane can be any plane that's perpendicular to the one zero zero direction. So maybe we should talk about it instead of as a vector, as a direction. Okay, what's perpendicular to north in this room? What what plane is perpendicular to north in this room? Yeah, which wall? That wall? That wall? Right? All the classrooms with walls that o are oriented the same way, right? Any plane inside this, this room that's uh, parallel to that wall, the north facing wall. Okay? Does that help? You can take a deck of cards. Every card is, is a plane that's parallel to the other uh, um, card. So they all have the same orientation. They're distinct planes, but they have the same orientation. So all we care about is orientation, direction. Okay. Okay, so now we've got another plane. Let's see if I can color that one in. Can you see that? Sometimes it doesn't show up on the, on the um, screen very well. Which, which one is that? That one's a little harder. One, one, one. Does everybody see that? Well, yeah, I mean, it's drawn within a cube, so you can get a understanding of what the orientation is. It's really hard to to represent a plane in two dimensions like this. So that's why we draw it as part of a cube. So that's the 1-1-1 one, 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 um, plane and it's perpendicular to the 1-1-1 one, one, one direction or vector. Okay, so we're going to look at the different uh, orientations okay so it depends how you look here we're looking down maybe the x-axis so the middle one on the bottom you're looking down a, the x-axis straight down the x-axis or maybe it's the y or maybe it's the z it really doesn't matter because it's a cubic crystal structure okay if you look at it top down or from the side it'll always look like this you can't tell. This one you're looking down the 111 plane. Now it looks different, doesn't it? So if I try to cleave it along the X, you know, looking down the X axis or the Y or the Z, it's going to break in the same pattern. If I try to break it down the 111 direction, it'll cleave or break in a different pattern. Okay, so if we go back to the website. Here we're looking down the 111 direction. Can you see that? And if we put it back to the way it was, it's kind of hard to do this. Okay, this is the Z, and then this axis is the X, and back here is the Y. This is parallel to Y. Okay, so I'm going to look down the X axis, it looks like that. But if I look down the Z axis, it's the same thing. Can you see that? Okay.
good. So how do you make crystals? Crystal silicon. You start with a seed crystal Okay, that has a specific orientation that you know. I'll tell you how, how you find out later. And then you dip the seed crystal into your molten silicon. And you saw a film on that recently. Then you slowly pull it out. And what happens is, is when that uh, seed crystal touches the surface of the molten silicon, the molten silicon atoms are moving around and they orient themselves exactly the same way as the seed crystal. And if you pull it out slow enough, all the layers that form on that seed crystal will be aligned exactly the same as the seed crystal. And you keep pulling it out, pulling it out, pulling it out, and you get what's called a, um, a boule or an ingot. There's two different names for it. Okay, and there's di two different methods of making it. The most common, I believe, is the CZ method. It's the uh, Chakralsky method. The float zone method I don't think is used as much. But I could be wrong. Things are always changing in the industry. And here's another picture of it. You can see the seed crystal is, is located at the end of a bar. The molten crystalline is below. You have heater coils around a crucible which has to withstand higher temperatures than 1415, right? Celsius. Okay, and what usually happens is the crucible will rotate in one direction and the um, seed crystal will rotate in another direction and that way you get the best um, orientation and the least amount of dislocations in the crystal. So we'll show you a video. This is a an actual um, animation done one by one of our students. So you can see the um, the bar is rotating clockwise, and I or yeah, clockwise, and the um, crucibles move rotating counterclockwise and you start to pull the um, crystal out and you do it uh, relatively quickly and then you start slowing down you then you go to a constant rate and how fast you pull it determines how big the boule will be how what diameter it'll be so with the four inch crystals it doesn't they pull it a little faster with the twelve inch crystals they pull it pretty slow it can take twenty four to forty eight hours to create one um, boule and if you mess up, you got to start over. Okay, do you remember the purity of the crystal or the silicon when you when you start? Nine nines, yeah, ninety nine point nine nines, nine nines in a row, percent pure. And then you might throw a little bit of boron in it or arsenic or something if you wanted to to dope it to give it a different electrical property. No, they're the same thing. An ingot and a boule is the same thing. Okay, you can see in the upper right, this is actual video of an um, ingot being uh, pulled. You can, you can almost see the crystal facets as it's going around. You do get some indication of that. And that's uh, when it's all done, they open up the chamber. They try to keep the chamber, you know, clean while they're pulling it. They don't want stuff falling into the uh, molten silicon because that'll add to the defects. And then the bottom right video shows how they actually slice the ingot. So when it's all done, you've got to go and slice it. Okay, and as you're slicing it, you have to be very careful to make it flat. Then you polish one side they usually only polish one side in semiconductors. Um, occasionally, you have to polish both sides. Uh, how many how many uh, wafers do you think you can get out of a, a bool? Bool's about four feet. Some of them are six feet long. Each wafer's 600 microns or so thick. But then you have to ask what other question. 
how big is the blade right because uh, the thinner the blade the better because then you can get more wafers out of it so they actually don't use a blade anymore they use a, a wire coated with um, diamond and they actually wire cut these so uh, that's that's pretty interesting so I'm gonna play this excerpt from Phil Silicon Magic hopefully it'll play there it goes and you can't hear it can you no. okay I forgot to plug in the speakers so we'll start it over again up all the way. I don't think I can do better than that, unfortunately. I'm going to play it again from another source and see if you guys can hear that. Oh well, I don't know why. This one? Thank you. And then we'll also try it from the video file directly.
this process begins with silicon, one of the most common elements found near the surface. Silicon is grown as a large, single crystal ingot. Its purity is carefully monitored and controlled. When the ingots are cooled, they are sliced into wafers of highly uniform thickness and polished to a mirror-like finish. Although other materials are used for certain applications, silicon is the most commonly favored material for building ICs. Silicon's ability to conduct electricity can be controlled by placing chemicals called dopants into its crystalline structure. Okay, so you can put dopants in there, change the electrical properties, but it doesn't really change the um, it doesn't really change the mechanical properties. Because uh, mechanical properties are basically determined through um, gross uh, changes in the structure, in the mechanical structure. Okay. So we showed how it's grown. These are different types of machines used to grow it. This is a person here on the lower left corner of the graphic. Gives you a sense of scale. Okay, the large 300. Uh, version makes 300 millimeter wafers which are like pizzas, 12 inches. That's what they use at um, Intel now for a lot of their processors. They use very large wafers. And then you can go all the way down to 3 inch and 4 inch and 5 inch wafers. Um, the most common used these days for MEMS is 6 inch. The equipment's available still at 6 inch. It's cheap because it's older technology and you don't have to you know pay an outrageous amount of money for the wafers they're roughly eighty dollars each or so okay depending what the pre-processing is and how well polished you want it that sort of thing okay so how can you determine the orientation of the seed crystal that's important right you're gonna put it on the end of this rod and build a ingot out of it you better have the orientation of the seed crystal right Okay, so you use uh, x-ray diffraction for it. So you put a, a beam of x-rays through and you see how it diffracts and the detector is either film or actually a, a, a detector, an electronic detector. And a computer can reconstruct what orientation it is from the diffraction pattern. Okay. In the old days they did this to determine, yes? A goniometer? No, that's uh, that's to measure the hydrophobicity of a uh, surface. This is a crystallography or um, X-ray diffraction tool. Okay, so you shine the X-ray beam through the crystal. It forms a distinct pattern depending on what type of crystal you have and what the orientation is. So you can rotate the crystal. You get different orientations. Okay, this has to be a collimated X-ray beam. Okay, has to be a pretty good x-ray beam source. Um, they use this type of apparatus to determine the structure of DNA back in what the 50s, right? Double helix. They crystallize the DNA, then they put an x-ray beam through it and they expose the piece of film for a long time because they had a very weak x-ray source. Okay, so it takes a while and then they get a diffraction pattern and the pattern may look like that and you can go to this website here and, and look at different diffraction patterns for different types of crystals and orientation okay so so there's a lot of information in this pattern the spacings between the dots and the relative orientations and the and the angles between the patterns the different dots on there get, can be reconstructed into a three-dimensional image of the crystal. Now in the old days they did it by hand. It was really tough for them to figure out the double helix okay, of, of the DNA. But it's pretty straightforward to do it for simple crystal structures. And now they have, um, they have computer programs that reconstruct 
what the three-dimensional pattern is. And they actually look at protein, they crystallize protein, and then they look at the structure of the proteins at Berkeley. I've seen them do that, and it's, it's pretty interesting. They, it takes a few days, and they can reconstruct a protein structure from the diffraction pattern. Okay, so now we're going to go break some wafers. <laughs>